All right, so today's today's lecture will be about Rust, but before we go there, um, I have uh, a question for you. So please join the uh, mentee. And the first question is, Um, yes. What is causing you problems in Haskell? You can tell me, those people who are in the room, or you can type if you're in Zoom, or you can type if you want to type. So what is the most annoying or most difficult or what is causing problems while you're doing all the Haskell work? Is it something to do with syntax or is it something to do with some concepts or uh, which concepts are, uh, yeah, so syntax, we can't really fix that one. Um, It's a different way of thinking about problems. Yes, it is. So that's a little bit painful. That is true. Changing the way you think. That's right. Uh, state, state is hard. So state in Haskell is hard. Um, we will talk a little bit more about it uh, on Wednesday. So I will uh, talk a little bit more about, what, uh, about state on Wednesday when we talk about the web framework and the uh, kind of a keeping updating a state of the student's database, right? So we will have kind of an in-memory database and we'll be updating the state. So I will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it is hard, yes. So, so dealing with state in a kind of a monadic way takes some time to get used to. Um, so don't be hard on yourself too much with this. Uh, list comprehensions. Yeah, so list comprehensions are, um, in other programming languages as well, for example, Python, uh, and being able to generate kind of a list using the list comprehension is a useful, it's a useful metaphor, uh, but not everybody likes it. Uh, so some people prefer to use like a loop to generate values and to do something more iteratively. Uh, and some, for some people, this kind of a concise notation of the list comprehension is, is very nice. Uh, I, I really like that. So I really like uh, sort of the functional flavor of uh, constructing certain things declaratively uh, instead of telling the computer, okay, do this, do this, do this, like in a, in a loop. But of course, this kind of a more imperative way is simpler. It's like you're telling exactly what needs to happen, whereas the declarative form requires you to think what I need to get out of this, right? Um, so state, yes, I will talk a little bit about state, syntax. I am having problems with syntax myself, like uh, especially if you're changing language, uh, you don't really remember how to express certain things and I have to look up syntax on, you know, on the internet. Uh, but that's, that's fine, uh, don't worry about syntax. Um, as long as you sort of understand the concepts, uh, as long as you know how to use the concepts, then the syntax is just a matter of practice, it's just a matter of spending enough time with the environment. Um, annoying thing for me in Haskell is the error messages. <laughs> so I will tell you ab about it on Wednesday. I, I spent like three hours uh, fighting the stupid type system and the error messages. <laughs> and it turned out I was just missing one word pack. Uh, so, it, and I, I just like, it was so simple, but the compiler was not helpful. <laughs> and like, I was really going crazy. So error messages and type system up can be annoying in, in Haskell as well. Uh, we can do a quick refresher on list comprehensions on Wednesday. So I will come back to some of those uh, things on Wednesday. Um, and today we switch gears. So again, we, we switching gears and the most annoying thing about Rust is the syntax. <laughs> so it's another programming language with another set of syntactic rules. And even though on surface, it's very similar to C++ type of languages, Rust is not, Rust has its own, um, you know, quirks. So what you need to get started, um, you need to install it. 
So you can go to the last link and just install it while I'm talking. Um, if you're on Mac or on uh, Linux, it's, it's a one liner and then it will install a Rust app. And then when you have Rust app installed, you can say upgrade uh, to upgrade your uh, installation of Rust, or you can say Rust app update, uh, and it will kind of check if there are anything new. So the, the latest version is 1.59, uh, and with Rust app is very easy to keep track of your uh, kind of a global installation. So I have, I have uh, kind of installed it for Mac on this laptop. Um, on the other laptop, I have two installations. I had the installation for Mac and I had an installation for ARM on Android because I was doing a little bit of Rust on Android and then I wanted to build an ARM executable. So you can, I don't have it here, but you can kind of tell Rust app what version of OS you want to install. And then you can cross compile your, your executable to Linux or to uh, Windows or to whatever platform you want. But that will require sort of an additional, um, sorry, additional um, installation of the runtime system for that particular platform. But it, you can do easily cross compiling on, on your laptop as well. So I recommend Rust up. Um, and then uh, we have couple of uh, resources. So the first fundamental resource is rustlink.org. Uh, and that's where everything kind of lives. Um, they, I was kind of checking it before the class and uh, they say it has a very rich type system and ownership model. Uh, that, that's very true. So the, the type system in Rust is it's not as rich as Haskell, but it's much richer than C++. So you can express kind of algebraic data types. We will talk about it later. Uh, so that the type system is a very strong point of, of Rust. Um, thread safety also because of the memory management kind of building, but that's the same for Golang or Haskell, right? Uh, you have kind of thread safety in, in those languages too. Um, they say it's blazingly fast. Uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, so Rust executable, if written really well, yes, you can benefit from the hardware and you can write really fast code. But if you're not careful and if you don't know what you're doing, your code will be slower than Golang. Uh, we've done tests last, last year and, and we can do it this, this year again. Uh, and it turns out uh, Rust was kind of not the top two. Um, so the compiler, of course, it differs on what compiler is doing and how the code is generated and also what you're doing in, in your code. But for you know reasonable applications, I don't think the performance in terms of raw speed is of a variable here anymore comparing languages. Anyway, so that's the, the kind of the main resource. And then this one is a book. Um, so you can read the book online, of course. And the book goes through, unfortunately, there is no REPL. It's a compiled language and you can't really REPL it. Uh, so you basically need to kind of go into the changing your code, compiling and checking how, how things work. Uh, but in the book, they do have like code snippets. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, for example, the hello world. Uh, and then you can sort of uh, uh, copy the code and run it yourself, or you can run it in the browser and it will kind of um, execute the examples and show you what the, the output is. So it is sort of semi-interactive uh, book. You probably need to go through it, you know, cover to cover, uh, but I will cover sort of uh, more important things first, and then you can only focus on those things that you need and kind of expand your knowledge. And similar to, um, to Haskell, there is like a package uh, repository where you can get additional resources like libraries for your code. Uh, and then you can search. So let's say we need some HTTP client library. So if I do the search, I will get um, a number of uh, answers, but it's a very good idea to always sort them by let's say all time downloads 
uh, because then you will see the sort of the two uh, top crates which are used by people. So all three of those are really good. And all three of those are kind of, uh, you can see 25 million, 35 and 42. Probably Hyper is taking over is like more popular, but sometimes all the libraries have will have this all time higher than the newer libraries. And the newer libraries are kind of more um, easier to use and so on. So this one is kind of uh, the one which we've used in the last year in some of the examples. Uh, but any of those three would be probably great for you to use. And then if you want like, you know, JSON uh, parsing, then Serda is the de facto standard library and you know, where, where you do uh, JSON parsing with. So this will kind of get you started. Um, and then a question to you, uh, give me keywords that are associated with doing kind of for loops. So not very abstract loops like in, mo in a monadic kind of looping and a recursion, just kind of a for loop. So we have some sort of iterator and we need to for one to 10, do it, okay? So what kind of keywords do you know? Uh, one is for, what are the keywords you can use for doing loops like this from other programming languages that you know? Yeah, do while, for, what else? So this is kind of like, a, yeah, you can use while. So we have um, while, we have do while, we have four, so we have three. What else do you, do you have? Yeah, you can have for each. So, but the, the you can have range, but uh, range is sort of, um, it's used inside the loop, right? Uh, you have loop. Um, yeah, you can do go to with, with a conditional. So, you know, RAS is a relatively young language. So when they were designing constructs for loops, um, same as with Golang. So Golang is kind of similar age, right? And the designers were saying, okay, like there are many different keywords for looping. What do we need to express? We need to express um, basically three different things, right? Uh, one thing is we need the not a classical for loop, which is from counter, like, you know, from i equals one to 10, okay? Something like this, right? So we need to loop like this. So that's the, the default loop and most languages use four for that, right? Another, another construct is we want to, to loop while a partic particular condition C is true, right? So we have kind of a while, okay? So we have four while. And then you may say, you may want you know, the condition might not be set yet. You need to do something before the condition is set. So we have the third version where you do kind of until, right? And then Pascal, you had curly braces and you say until, right? And then there was a condition. But most modern programming languages, they would say do this while, right? So we have one, two, three, until it's not used that much anymore. So we have uh, one, two, three, the keywords, right? Uh, what else do we need to express? Well, we may want to express an infinite loop, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, while true, right? An infinite loop, right? And most languages say while true. <laughs> okay, so those are kind of the four usual use cases for doing loops, right? Uh, and we have three keywords for that, right? And in Golang, they said, yeah, I mean, you know, when you're learning a language, you need to learn about those four different loops. But how about just having a single keyword for all four cases, right? Would that be simpler? And the designer said, yeah, that would be simple. You just learn one keyword and then it covers all those four cases. In, in Rust, they, they didn't came up with that concept. <laughs> so in Rust, they said, okay, we need, we need keyword for this. We need keyword for this. Uh, and we need keywords for the infinite loop, right? And they completely missed the third case, right? <laughs> so um, let's move on. Come on. So the question for you is, 
what's the most uh what, what's the most yeah i already kind of spoiled it right i kind of uh spoiled the uh the thing here so which language has the most messed up constructs for loops yes rust why because they introduce three keywords or something that you really need just one and then they completely miss that case which is not that uncommon you you kind of you know see this in code very often and this in rust looks like this okay so how ugly is that right <laughs> so you either have something with an empty body just to achieve this kind of a do while condition or you have to manually be testing the condition yourself and putting break in your code like come on right so there are like i really like rust <laughs> but there are some design decisions which i think are really strange and this is like really super strange right um and it's not like you need really complex it like look at golang like just one keyword covers all four cases very nicely intuitive nice syntax come on you could have done better so this is super ugly like do while in rust okay forget it all right so in question to you why do we learn those four languages in this program like why do we try to teach you four languages in this bachelor um and why the choice of those four languages what do you think uh sorry online people i should have changed let me see I should have changed the background. You should have told me that you don't see the the whiteboard. Okay, how do I close this? All right, so that was the four cases for loops. Okay, so covers the basic programming terms and thinking and concepts. Very good. Um, variety of use cases, different paradigms. That's very good. Um, they are for different things. True. Um, so they, they all have um, some kind of nice features, some good, bad features, some, some things are kind of very nice, some are a little bit awkward. Um, and you kind of get exposed to it, but that that's not the main reason. So um, there are two main reasons. So for example, we could have kept Python here, right? We don't, we really don't teach you Python. I mean, you will know Python anyway, uh, you know, before you graduate, you will know Python, even though we don't teach you. Uh, we don't really teach you JavaScript neither. Again, you will know JavaScript even if we don't teach you, right? Um, so there are two reasons for that. So one reason is that, with the exception of Golang, which is a little bit odd, the other three, like C, C++, Family, uh, Haskell, and Rust, are actually hard languages. They are hard languages to learn. You cannot just sit down at home, spend a couple of weeks, and learn them quickly. You need to spend time with them, right? So in the degree, you have three years, and you can spend a substantial amount of time with those languages to get yourself up to kind of intermediate level. Uh, and that's the, the, the one, one of the reasons. And then the second reason is, okay, so question to you, what is systems programming? What is usually contrasted with systems programming? We don't know, we don't know. 
All right, so from one hand, we have systems programming. On the other hand, we have applications programming. So given that in extra information, what do you think is systems programming? Can you do multiple submissions? I always forget to click that. All right, so I can see we are having a little bit trouble with this. So system programming. So let's go to Wikipedia or to Google. And they say systems programming, development of computer software that is part of a computer operating system or other control program, especially as used in computer networks. Systems programming covers data and program management, including operating systems, control programs, network software, blah, blah, blah. That's from the, that's from the an, an encyclopedia. And then if you go to Wikipedia, it's basically the same, but it says system, systems programming is the activity of programming computer soft, soft systems, uh, computer system software. The primary distinct, distinguishing characteristic of systems programming when compared to application programming is that application programming aims to produce software which provides services to the user directly. Whereas systems programming aims to produce software and software platforms which provide services to other software, right? So you could say systems programming is a superset where you are developing software for being used by software and for other software, whereas applications development, applications programming is to produce applications which are user facing, right? So we have certain kind of outside, like if, 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 if this kind of a big ball, you know, is software, then on the auxiliary, you have software which talks to the users. And then inside you have software which is designed primarily to talk to other software, right? So. For example, if you think about the browser, um, the browser is from one hand, it's a application which the user is using, but from the other hand, it's a platform which renders HTML, which executes JavaScript, which kind of software is using. So HTML and JavaScript are using the browser to kind of render the, 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 um, the content. So it is both, a browser is both, but majority of the browser is actually a system designed for the other software. And that's why Rust came in, right? So Rust came in from the Firefox Foundation because they needed a better language to rewrite the C++ uh, implementation of Firefox because it was really buggy and it was really difficult to do proper memory management and threading, multi-threading. And as we know from the last lecture, web applications, web things, are inherently concurrent because you want to do many things at the same time. So that's where Rust came from. And that's what uh, is the sort of the, um, the main original, um, like a killer app for Rust. It's a browser, right? So systems programming is something that all those four languages have in common. They are very good at doing both. You can do applications with them, and you can build systems with them, right? Would you write a browser in JavaScript or in Python? No, you wouldn't. So those are kind of our user facing languages, which are nice for uh, programming applications, but not for programming systems. Whereas those four are sort of the fundamental core languages used in computer science to produce platforms and software, right? All right, so what is Rust? Um, Rust is actually heavily inspired by Haskell. So if you know Haskell, then learning Rust is pretty much just learning syntax because um, most concepts that are in Rust, you already know from Haskell. Um, it doesn't have a garbage collector. So all the memory management is on you, same as with C and C++, for example. But the difference is that the compiler enforces certain rules such that you will not be able to mess up memory. Even though you manage memory by hand, it's actually the compiler kind of uh, is a safeguarding that whatever you're doing follows certain strict rules. And that's 
pain in the ass also. So you will have a lot of problems with the uh, borrow checker in Rust because of that, of that safety. Um, it's an excellent for embedded systems and excellent for resource bound systems and for real time systems. And the flagship example is a browser, right? Uh, and you can have a very small and tiny core. So for example, with Golang, the, the, if, you, if you just do hello world and you compile it and you check how big is the executable, it, it will have certain sizes. It's not very big, but it will have certain size and it will be a little bit harder to strip all the stuff that you're not using from it. Whereas in Rust, it's already designed in such a way that you can strip everything and be kind of a bare bone uh, such that you can um, compile it onto the, uh, you know, uh, very tiny embedded systems. And that's why it's so, it, it is kind of a finding itself a niche. So if you go to the, uh, to the Rust blank, you will see that they have, um, they had kind of like a, um, yeah, anyway, like one of the use cases where Rust kind of shines is WebAssembly because it's really easy to integrate it with and compile it into a very tiny, executable, which can be shipped uh, in, in a form of a WebAssembly for actually making the, um, the interactivity of the, of the websites. So, okay, so let's move on. Okay, so some more facts about Rust. Maybe clicking here is easier. So um, Rust is statically typed, uh, same as Haskell or C++. Uh, there is no garbage collector. I already talked about it. Uh, there is kind of a compile time memory management. So all the memory, of course, is managed on at the compile time because, um, like, of course, the memory is sort of uh, managed at runtime, but at compile time, the compiler enforces certain rules such that you will not have memory leaks and you will not have kind of access, concurrent access to, to memory such that you will not have uh, threading uh, bugs. There is no inheritance. So same as Golang, uh, Rust decided to go with structs and decided to go with delegation instead and composition instead of inheritance. So it's basically the same as in Golang. So we will talk a little bit about it in a moment. And then mutability is not as hard as in Haskell, but by default, everything you do in, in Rust is also immutable, right? And it's not a la lazy language. So you can have uh, lazy collections and you can do certain things lazily, but you know, normally it's just an imperative language where your expressions are evaluated you know, in, in, in sequence. Um, so there is no laziness, but uh, mutability, you have to tell the compiler, I want to be mutating this variable and then it becomes um, mutable. All right, so those are the facts, uh, how it feels to program in, in, uh, in Rust. Well, you know, semicolons and curly braces are back. So all the typical C++ uh, constructs are back, um, but, and the types are on the right-hand side. So the types are kind of like in Golang, you do them on the right-hand side of your variables and so on, but you need to have this uh, column, right? So you have a variable and you say, this variable type is this, and then you have the assignment. And then you cannot have assignments to variables without declaring the variables first. So you have this let keyword, which basically introduces sort of a new um, new variable. So syntax is very similar to C family, but it's a little bit different. And you don't have the power of um, the power of uh, combinators from Haskell, but you can do certain things with using macros and and um, to some extent, you can simulate some of the combinators that we have in Haskell using uh, Rust macros. And there are some libraries which are already doing it. So for example, Rust doesn't have um, Python-like uh, list comprehensions, but you can have macros which basically simulate 
kind of a Python-like list comprehensions in, in Rust. All right, so what, what else can we say about um, Rust? Well, I thought to, to give you kind of a, a little bit of a difficulty scale, how difficult Rust is. But first I will ask you, what do you think, how would you order those languages that you already know? So on the, on the disagree is easy and on the strongly agree is hard. So you kind of try to order your feel of how you would kind of uh, map those languages according to your own feel uh, where they fit. So for example, is Python easier than C or not? And is JavaScript easier than C++ or Haskell? Where, you know, where would you rank them? Um, so how hard a given language is, right? Um, if you don't know yeah, a language, then just kind of guess uh, of, of place it somewhere, right? Yeah, if you, yeah, perfect. So if you can skip, then just skip. So my, my perception, because I, uh, my history of learning programming languages is different than yours, right? I actually started programming using assembly and I thought assembly was quite hard, <laughs> which, which is true. <laughs> and then, uh, but once you start with assembly and then I, I actually went to basic, uh, no, I, sorry. So my, my first programming language was basic. I thought basic was easy. Then I learned assembly and then I thought, oh shit, assembly is much harder than basic. Um, and then I was learning how Pascal and Pascal has all those kind of uh, concepts like, you know, routines, loops, all those things. And I actually had a hard time learning Pascal after learning assembly because in assembly, you know, there are no concepts, you just go to do everything and you just, you know, do things in sequence, right? So assembly in, in that regard is actually super simple and Pascal was kind of hard. Uh, and then I learned this. And Lisp was hard too, but Lisp kind of introduced me to functional programming and so on. So I, I have kind of a different, um, like, you know, relative uh, difficulty scale than you, but according to your um, kind of ratings, Golang is definitely sort of on an easy side, right? And then C++ seems to be harder than, um, C seems to be harder than C++, but that's, a paradox, right? Of course, that's not true because uh, C++ is C plus extra shit, right? So it cannot be simpler than just this, this C bit, right? So if you're learning, if you already know C, then maybe uh, it's easier to learn this extra stuff. But I, I think, you know, C should be easier than C++. Um, and then Python, yeah, JavaScript is actually quite hard, uh, especially because of the, all the syntactic rules and all the extra stuff that is unnecessary in the language. So I would say, yes, maybe it is kind of a hard issue. And then I agree, Haskell is kind of up there. So what I did, I kind of, um, so you will have to calibrate my, my rating to your rating. Uh, I sort of ranked C uh, to be easier than C++ and I ranked C sort of similar to Go, uh, I thought, Maybe go is just a little bit easier than C, um, but they are kind of easy. And then C++ is kind of in the middle. Haskell is the hardest and Rust is probably easier than Haskell, but harder than C++, right? So it's sort of in between C++ and, and Haskell. Um, all right, so let's do a kind of a, core language overview of what we need to know. So how do you learn a new programming language? Well, I check, you know, what, what type system do I have? Like what types are already in the language and what I can do with the types myself, right? So there are, there are no surprises here. Uh, we have value types, you know, integers, floats, uh, bools, uh, we have tuples, you know, tuples from Haskell and you know tuples, yeah, even in uh, C++ we have tuples these days. Uh, there are structs, uh, arrays and slices, you know the difference between arrays and slices now from Golang, uh, sort of, 
same here. Um, so it's sort of like vector and arrays in C++, right? Uh, and then there are enum types. Enum types are different to enum types from C++. They are just like data types in Haskell, right? So I don't know why, like, again, some design decisions are kind of a little bit puzzling for me because I would not call this what they are doing with the keyword enum. Uh, I would call it data because that's what Haskell is using and that's what would be kind of what it actually does, right? Uh, but those are the, the kind of fundamental uh, types that you have. So it's, you know, business as usual. Um, so then there is this type alias, uh, which is exactly like in Haskell, right? So if you say type, my new type equals some existing type, then you define your own type, which is basically an alias for the other type. It, it's exactly the same as in Haskell. Um, note that types in Rust, uh, the, 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 this rule is not enforced by the compiler, but this is like a rule which is enforced by linters and some code uh, checkers uh, that types in uh, your own defined types in Rust should be following the same rules as Haskell. So they are camel, camel cases, right? So you start with capital letter and then you follow kind of a camel case, which is not the rule for your function names and your variable names, which use snail case, right? So we start with lowercase and you, we use underscores. So Rust is using both, is using camel case and snail case, uh, snail case for everything and camel cases for types, right? Uh, and that makes it co consistent with, with uh, languages like Haskell. All right, so type alias is very simple. Um, basic types are simple. Um, and I think they are sort of, um, one, two, three, four, five. And they are kind of um, very similar to, um, to Golang, right? So we have uh, integer. Uh, integer types, and then you basically say what size that integer is. Unsigned integers, same up to 128, and then floats, a 32 bit and a 64 bit floats. So in Golang, you say float 32, here you just say F32, right? But it effectively, it's the same thing. Uh, bool, same thing. And then for strings, we have this kind of a heavy class string, and then we have a slice. Okay, so this awkward looking thing. Um, it's a reference to a string slice and that is also the type of string literals, right? So if I say hello in quotes, that would be of that type. And then that type is immutable, right? So I cannot kind of change what's inside and like how, how to do it. Whereas with this one, I can do some, some things. Uh, so those are basic types. Tuples, yeah, again, no, um, no mystery here. So we have um, a, a kind of a tuple, which takes um, an integer and a string, right? So if I go here, so let's do uh, a simple project where I can play with the code a little bit. So if you, if you install uh, Rust, you will have what in, uh, in Haskell is called stack. Uh, here is called cargo. Uh, and then you can create a new project and you can say, I want a new project in my current folder, which will be in hello Rust folder, subfolder. Uh, so you can do that and it will generate the stuff. Um, so then I can go in there and it creates uh, a very simple structure with this kind of a package uh, meta file, which describes what your package is and so on. It's kind of like package YAML in Haskell. It's same story. And then in here, uh, I have my uh, source code, right? Uh, and the source code is with RS extension and the file name doesn't matter. Um, so if I go here, and I open it, then you will see that the, the generated code 
you know, you already see the, the keyword for defining functions. Then the main function is called main, uh, curly braces, uh, semicolon at the end of the line. Everything looks kind of normal. Um, the only abnormal thing here is the exclamation mark. So exclamation marks mark macros. So this is not a function. This is a macro, right? So all the macros in, in uh, Rust will have exclamation mark at the end, right? So then if I say, uh, let uh, my tuple, and I had this type, so I32 um, string literal, right? I can assign it to a tuple, which is like, you know, uh, 2022 and then a string, right? So hello, and I put semicolon and then I save it and it's fine. There should be, yeah, there should be a complaint that I de declare this, but I don't use it, right? Uh, so if we go, and do cargo run. Hello, Ross. And indeed, there is a warning. So it says a warning you have unused variable, right? So it's not an error, but it's a warning that I de declared T and it's unused, right? So while we are with tuples, I just give you one more. So let's change it to float, right? So I will say I have a tuple between float and a string, right? So if I save it um, and we try to compile it again, I probably should use like a better ID such that you see those errors immediately. I will have a compiler error. <laughs> and, and you look at this and you say, what the hell? It's fine, right? Um, yeah, so I, I do have this error now. So if I, Hoover over it, it says mismatch types expected F32, but found integer, right? And you already get annoyed because you got spoiled with Haskell uh, polymorphic literals, right? 2022 could be a float, could be an integer, could be anything. This isn't just a number. And here the you know compiler is very picky saying, oh, look, look, this looks like an integer. It's probably integer, right? So it's annoying, but you do need to point, you know, uh, you know, do literals literally like this, right? So all the floats, you actually have to pretend they are not round numbers. Otherwise the compiler will complain, right? Um, in Haskell, that was a float uh, when it needed to be a float, even though you didn't need to say dot zero, right? Um, so here you have to say it. And if you do this, then I, we end up with just a warning of this unused T. Uh, but this and like that annoys me this dot zero thing annoys me kind of a lot um but that that's just like a symptom right the the inability to do polymorphic literals is kind of a big disadvantage already right so in haskell or in some other languages where your literals can be polymorphic that's kind of you can see that's you know a, a, an added value um and of course you can have um you can have an empty tuple so same as empty tuple in, uh, in Haskell. Um, okay, so structs. Um, we have uh, three types of structs. Uh, we have normal structs like in, um, like in uh, Golang or in uh, C++ or C. So it's just a struct with a named fields. Um, you can have a struct which doesn't have names in the fields, which is basically like a named tuple, right? So our tuple here didn't have a name. Um, so this, this tuple doesn't have a name, but you can actually define a type, which is that tuple and it has kind of a type name and that's like a struct, but the fields don't have names. They have indexes, zero and one, right? Um, and then there is a unit struct. And unit struct is sort of like a singleton, which just defines a type, but it doesn't have any fields at all, right? So then it's sort of like a singleton that you use um, to you know, name something or identify something concrete. 
So I will not type the code. I have the screenshot of the code. So this is like an example of a struct with named fields, X and Y, uh, and then values. And this would be point, you know, F32, F32, because you see those are dot zero. So that has to be floats, right? Uh, this one is a singleton struct. The, there are no fields inside. And then there's nothing in me. You can use it just nothing in me, or you can use it nothing in me quote at uh, the brackets. And it's exactly the same thing. They are, are synonymous. And then you can have a tuple. So we have again F, F32, F32. And we say tuple point. Uh, and the tuples are indexed zero and one and so on, right? So you can access the, the fields of the of the tuple this way. Uh, and here we are defining kind of a game user, and the game user has name, age, and score. Um, and then uh, we can kind of um, do something like with, with, with that particular user, with that particular struct, right? I don't know why this was in the in the examples. Um, it's probably like a, a demonstration of some parametric uh, gener gen generic uh, declarations. Okay, so to sum up, syntax is same as in Go and C++. C++ uh, although the struct comes, it's like struct name and then the the curly braces. Um, and then, uh, same as in Golang, uh, structs can have implementations, right? So you can have um, one more. Um, yeah, so one less. That that we will do after the break. So let's let's do a quick uh, implementation for a particular struct. So let's say uh, we have a struct. Let's define a struct, uh, which will be uh, struct uh, my, I don't know, I'm not very creative, my F. And then this struct will have a field, let's say name, uh, and that name will be a string. And you have H, which is, um, Load 32. Okay. So then uh, with this, you can say implement. Um, and then you say you are implementing for my F uh, functions, which will be able to operate on that struct. And then you, you're basically doing the same as uh, with the function declaration. So you say um, function, the name of the function at uh, one one year uh, and then you say because the first parameter to that function is the reference to the object which we are kind of having because okay so we, we will have let's say uh, Bob so let Bob be my F and then we say its name is Bob and its age is 10 years old, right? So we will have Bob, and then we will say Bob dot this add one, uh -huh, one year. We should be following the rules. So then I will call this like this and see the function doesn't take any parameter, uh, but because I will be operating on this Bob instance here. Uh, when you're defining the, um, the the method, if you when you're defining the um, uh, the body, you have to be able to refer to Bob, and you you're referring to Bob via this um, reference to self. So in some programming languages it's called this, right? Uh, but in in this programming language it's called self. Um, so then you can say self. Um, what is it? Age plus was one right so we can do this and that would be kind of the um the declaration of a method which you can call on the instance of, of your struct it's exactly the same as in golang right 
Any questions so far? If there are no questions, I will save that to see if I didn't mess anything up. I, it seems I didn't. So then I will uh, print. Print line. Okay, when you're printing, uh, there is just a normal string, literal like this, uh, which we did here. Or if you want to print Bob, then I have to say, uh, we have got Bob. And then I use this to refer to the, to the variable that I will add um, as an argument to this macro. Uh, if I try to save it, it will probably complain that it doesn't know how to print Bob because Bob doesn't implement um, display, right? It, it's not showable like in Haskell terms, right? Uh, let didn't complain. Yeah, so it's not a string literal, it is just a string. Yeah, the sizes, yes, uh, forget about it. I uh, don't want to deal with this at the moment. So just let's focus on Bob H. Um, right, so then I need to use, yeah, yeah, that's also complicated. Yeah, so Rust is a bit complicated because uh, I cannot really mutate shit. Um, I have to be kind of, um, so let's do something else. Let's do this and let's do that this function returns, it will be a pure function. And this function returns um, uh, F32. And I just return the F32 instead of mutating the, I don't want to talk about it yet, right? So, Let's uh, save it. Um, yeah. It's zero, no polymorphic numbers. Okay. And Bob doesn't have a name. So we're almost there. We adding the so we say let new age equals this, and then we just print new age. We've got new age for Bob, and it will be this. Okay. That looks good, apart from the polymorphic literals. H is 10 originally, and then we should get 11. Perfect. All right, so let me try that. So clear cargo run. Hello world, a new H for Bob is 11. So our plan worked and we have two new things. So one thing is when you're declaring what the function returns, in Golang, you would just say F32. Here, you have to say this, this thing. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> could be just, you know, could be just type, uh, but you have to do this. Uh, and then notice that there is no semicolon in this line, right? So if I put a semicolon here, uh, I will have a compiler error, um, which says, um, it says here, Mismatch types. So it implicitly returns an empty tuple, whereas I should be returning uh, an F32, right? Why is that? Well, because this last line is a statement. Um, so it evaluates and it just stays in here. Uh, and then it goes to a next statement, which is an empty statement. And then it implicitly returns, like doing this is equivalent to having code like this, right? Uh, but if I do this, then it's an equivalent to a code like this. So the last 
last value uh, which is not used by anything. And in that case, this is the value. Like this 11 is kind of a, this h plus 10 plus one is a new value, which is not a statement uh, and it's not used anywhere. And that's what, what is returned when I call this function. So you don't need to use the return in Rust because the last thing that you're doing, as long as it has no semicolon at the end, will be the thing that is returned from a function. So that's a very neat feature, right? Uh, compared to Golang, for example. Um, so this becomes an expression whose value is returned as, a, as I'm calling this function, right? All right, so, okay. So, so far, no mystery uh, implementation for the struct, uh, a little bit of a quirkiness with this uh, return type of the, of the function. And notice also in lack of consistency, right? When you say a variable have a, has a particular type, you say colon. But when you say a function returns a particular type, you use this arrow, right? So if they had to use something, I would say, why, why you didn't use the, you know, why, why you didn't use, so why you didn't do this, right? That, that would be kind of more consistent, right? Um, well, I was not designing that language, so. <laughs> Maybe you, one of you will design a better language. Um, so that's also the reason why we learn in so many languages because we don't know what you will be programming in, in 10 years. And I hope it will be none of those languages that I'm teaching, you, right? Uh, so in 10 years, if you're programming in one of those languages, you did something wrong with your career, right? <laughs> All right, so let's have a break. Um, timer, seven minutes, such that we meet 20 past one. And I will pose and pause the recording. All right, so any questions about structs and implementation for structs? Yes, there are questions related to this mut mut mutability thing. Uh, so I don't want to be explaining that. We will have a separate lecture on, on it, but when you want to modify the self in this method, then you will have to declare that you're actually taking um, taking a mutable uh, reference instead of just reference. And then you can kind of um, mutate the self, right? You can uh, change what, what safe is. Um, that, that would be kind of uh, the, the way to, to modify the age of that struct when we're passing it. When we're passing it like this, it's read only. So when, when we doing this, we know Bob is not gonna be touched because this is read only, right? This, this call is read only without this mute inside here. All right, so that's probably all we need to know for now. Um, okay, I will save this. Oh, come on. I will save this and quit. And kind of a, just as a, a digression, uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, the developer controls the memory alignment in the, uh, in the book. So let's go to the book. Um, or, yeah, read the book. And then if I go to struct, defining an instantiation structs, so you will see the same, the same thing here, blah, blah, blah. But I want to, where was it? That's not the, that's not. Mm. 
Yeah, I don't remember where, where, where was it, so I will just search for it. Race. We talk a little bit about it in a moment. Well, okay, the, it's not that important. You will probably be not using it. Uh, what is important is the concept of alignment. So the question to you is, so how it is actually done inside the uh, Rust? Yeah, that, that's just syntax. Um, yeah, so this is like the an example which I typed in um, and the question to you is what is memory alignment and why do we care so in, in rust you can um, easily align your structs and you can align your data structures um, you can do the same in c um, i I, I presume in C++ as well. I haven't done it in C++. I only have done it in C. Uh, but in here, you can also do it. Uh, and what it is and why do we care? Exactly. So um, the answer uh, in the um, in the menti is, is correct. So, Okay, so in short, um, we have a particular architecture that the program runs on, and then the architecture itself has some constraints. So, um, so one of the constraints is, um, so if, if this is my memory, and let's say it starts at a certain address here, and then it goes byte by byte, right? So if, uh, Zero byte, first byte, second byte, and so on, right? Um, so this is one, two, three, four, four bytes. Um, and then if I have four another four bytes, then this is eight. Okay. And then uh, I may have another block of eight, and I have blah, 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 like this, right? And then um, the memory management unit uh, and the cache lines, which work with memory. Uh, so this is my memory, and this is my CPU. And my CPU will have kind of a cache, um, which um, it, it depends on the architecture of the CPU, but this cache line is something between 16 to 64 bytes usually. Um, so let's say we have one that, that actually has 16 bytes, right? Let's say, I don't remember Intel, but one of the Intels had like 16 bytes. So it will read 16 bytes at once and put them here, right? Um, and then uh, depending how you align your structs. So let's say uh, you have uh, a struct which is uh, three bytes. So if you have uh, an array of those uh, of those structs, you will have the first struct finishing here, and then the second one finishing here. Uh, but if you are operating on the cache line, which is 16 bytes, and if you're operating on the addre uh, addressable, um, so addressable space, which is, let's say we are doing 64 bit, um memory access so that that is uh eight bytes 
right? So the CPU will only be able to read here and here, right? So given certain constraints, I can only read from here or I can read from here. I cannot read from here. And as we see, the, the third element kind of is in, the, in, in, in between, right? It's in between where the CPU can read or write. So now if you say, I want to read that, uh, that record from here, then it needs two instructions to read that plus to read that and then to splice that kind of the boundary to do some kind of a fancy operation in, in here, right? And then when you say, I want to write uh, to this location, it's the same kind of problem, right? You, you kind of require two operations instead of one. So if you realign it and you say, actually my, um, you know, my structs are aligned in such a way that it's a multiple of eights, then I will be sure that if I have something starting somewhere, it will be starting on the on the proper place, and then my struct with those three elements will kind of um, um, it will be just one operation instead of two operations, right? Uh, because I will be hitting kind of the, the the I will not be hitting the boundary. So it's kind of a very hand wavy way of saying basically that when you don't have aligned stuff in your memory you will be less performant because your CPU will be probably doing often two reads and two writes plus some masking, some uh, bit operations for masking because you, you know, um, if, if in the original case, half of like part of it was the previous record and here I have my new record and it can only read uh, from here, then it needs to kind of mask this to rewrite it back and then to change this. So it's kind of complicated, right? It, it, and it uh, affects the performance. So what we do is we try to kind of uh, deal with this uh, by, um, by uh, doing a proper alignment of, um, of structs. And then you can, like you as a developer, you control how the fields are aligned and how the structs are aligned. And there is like a keyword called repr, R-E-P-R, -E uh, which you use to kind of uh, say what are the units that you want the memory alignment to use, whether it's like four bytes or eight bytes or what, what is it, right? <clears throat> All right, so then erase, same as Golang, same as in C++, um, it's just um, fixed type, a uh, fixed number of elements and they have to be the same type. And then you declare how many they are and then what type it is, right? So this is a declaration of a type. It says, I will have, uh, so if I go to the example, so let's define, define, So let uh, my array be my array be uh, e thirty two numbers. Sorry, and I have um, you know four of them, right? So that kind of declares my array to be of that type. So the the length will be four, and the type of the items will be integers. Um, I can basically uh, do this. So I can say my array is one, two, three, right? And that means now I have, it's kind of an equivalent to an array which has E32 type and has length three, correct? Um, there are some kind of a neat shortcuts. So let me see, yeah. So one neat shortcut is this default. Um, constructor, which basically initializes this array to default values. And then the default values will be zero for integers. But let's say you want all the initial values to be one, you can use this syntax. So you can say, I want to have 10 elements, all of them being one, and then um, you will kind of get this, decla this declaration fulfilled, right, in, in instantiated. 
All right, so arrays are kind of a no mystery here neither. Uh, functions. So with functions, we know already the fn keyword. So it's like fun in Golang, it's fn here. Uh, and then we have closures. That's the first, a little bit more complicated uh, concept that we will dive into. And then we have higher order functions, which we will dive into in the separate lecture. So let's talk a little bit about closures. So question to you. Very good. It's false. Closures and anonymous functions are not the same thing. Um, many, many closures are anonymous functions and many anonymous functions are used as closures, but they are kind of unrelated to each other. So it doesn't depend. They are basically, that, that statement is, is uh, false, right? So closures and anonymous functions are not the same thing. All right, so then some more trivia. What is anonymous function? Yes. Uh, anyone wants to explain why it depends? I, I think that definition is quite uh, concise and quite accurate. So if you have a function without a name, that is what anonymous function is. Okay, so then the next trivia. I can see I, I was quite creative with distractors. <laughs> so closure is a function that captures something from its outer context. That is also the definition of closure. Um, it should not depend on the programming language. It's a computer science concept, which is independent of programming language used. So a closure is a function that captures something from its outer context. Um, okay. One more. Closure must be an anonymous function. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be, but in Rust it, it is. But in general, closure does not need to be an anonymous function. And um, we have a leaderboard. So let's see how the top performers are doing. Frederick is doing really well. All right. And then Okay, I have one more. Yeah, that one you may not know the answer. Um, although I kind of already spoiled it. So in Rust, named functions cannot be closures. Right, so let's let's try, okay? So let me delete this array thing. Uh, and let's try to have a function which uh, says hello, okay? So I have a hello function, which, um, oops. 
which does not return anything and it prints print line print line oh yeah that's one of the annoying things is haskell i cannot easily do this like I, you cannot easily do functions which do io right uh, okay so my hello function is printing hello and then if i save it i hopefully have no why are you complaining so let me build it to see if i have no oh yeah because i didn't put the semicolon of course i didn't put the semicolon because i got spoiled with languages that don't do this anymore okay so then i need to kind of put semicolon here as well okay uh, seriously what do you want to return nothing say it again oh yeah that's a warning all right so let's call hello so we call hello And then probably don't need the region. All right, so um, let me try this. I don't trust. Do I need to define the Type. Maybe. Let's do uh, two and let's say uh, let's do an empty. Yeah. Empty couple. Say it again. No, ah, it's missing. Yeah, you're right. I'm I'm missing opening brace here. I hate languages with braces. Okay, so this let's see. Perfect. Okay, so the, the whole problem was with this missing brace in line nine. All right, so we have a function and that will compile and that will work fine. Uh, so let's let's run it just to confirm. Perfect. Uh, hello, princess. Hello. What if I will try to say um, if I will try to access uh, Bob uh, Bob uh, what's Bob uh, H right so if I try to do that um, I have a I have an error. And the error says can't capture dynamic environment in a function. Right? So that's your answer to this question. In Rust, named functions cannot be closures. That's true. A named function cannot be a closure. I cannot capture an environment inside my body of the of the named function. I can only do that with the anonymous functions, which are called closures in Rust. Okay, so then we have a new updated leaderboard, no, no big changes. 
and a homework for you is write an example of an anonymous and named closures in the languages you know in Golang or in Haskell, right? And I think that will be an ideal ideal uh, exam question as well. <laughs> so that will be a good homework for you to do because I think it will be in the exam. Uh, it's easy. Uh, you you kind of that would be a named example of a named closure in Rust, but it's illegal, right? But if you do this in in Golang, if you do equivalence thingy in Golang, that would work fine. And that's an example of a named function, which is a closure, right? Um, we often do that in, in Golang. We often do that in, in Haskell as well. So you can have anonymous and, and named uh, functions, which are closures. In Rust, um, you do have to, you, you have to use, um, you have to use a concept which they call closure. Um, okay, so then one final quiz about this. So in Rust, all anonymous functions are closures. And this is, uh, this is why we have so many, um, Yeah, anyway, I, I, yeah, so the, of course the answer is false because you can have anonymous functions which don't capture anything from the environment. We had this example here. Uh, so if I don't capture anything from the, if I use an anonymous function instead of this named function um, and I, capture and I don't capture anything from the out uh, from the environment then uh, I am actually I am actually having an anonymous function which is not a closure uh, but um, in in rust they call anonymous function closures uh, and it sort of feels like uh, you would have, like the name closure in Rust is abused because it means anonymous functions, which can be closures, but don't have to be, right? Okay, so to sum that up, uh, why it is so complicated? Um, uh, what do you think? Why it is so complicated? So they did the mistake, like they named it closures when they meant anonymous functions, okay? So that, that's just a design mistake, but why it is so complicated? Well, it is so complicated because of memory management. Um, so the, uh, like if I go back here, um, I don't want, so let's, let's revert back to the name function. Hello, right? So if you have a function uh, and it can manipulate something from outside of its body, right? So it sort of uh, checks, um, accesses something from outside of the body of the function, then managing memory becomes a little bit much more complicated and you cannot do that with those sort of uh, named functions. You have to involve additional machinery to be able to track all the kind of references to the outer context from within your own context. And to do that, you have to tell Rust that you're doing it, that you're kind of accessing something from outside of the function context. Um, and because of the memory management, Rust is a little bit complicated about, about that. All right, so question to you, what are the higher order functions? 
Easy question. Very good. So functions that, that take other functions as parameter or functions that return another function as a return or both, right? So higher order functions are basically functions that can either spill out a function or use a function or do both. Uh, and Rust, same as Golang and same as Haskell uh, are very easy to do that. Of course, you can write higher order functions in C and you can write higher order functions in C++ as well. It's just a very tedious task, right? And it's kind of uh, a little bit ugly in, in terms of how it looks, but you can do higher order functions in all programming languages and you can do them in, um, you can do them in Rust. And we, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is just an example of code that is using this functional flavor of programming inside Rust, which is very similar to what we were observing uh, inside uh, Haskell, right? So here we have sort of an infinite collection from zero going upwards, right? Numbers from zero upwards. And then we are applying map to this collection. And the map takes a number and returns power of it, power, power of two, right? And then we, from the result, which is again, the collection, we take while and we take, we, we are passing kind of a, another anonymous function here. So th this is a, a anonymous function, which takes n and returns the square of n, right? It's not a closure. It doesn't capture any outside of the environment. It's just an anonymous function. Although in, in Rust, it is called closure, right? Even though it's not a closure. Um, so then you have another anonymous function here and that one compares if the number uh, which is passed to it is smaller than the upper limit. And we want to do this up to this upper limit, let's say thousand numbers, right? Um, and then we filter. Again, we have an anonymous function in here, uh, and then we fold, right? Which is <clears throat> basically what, what it does, it calculates a sum of the power of two of all the odd numbers between zero and upper, which in this case is thousand, right? Um, so th this is like the, the, the rest of the code is here. You can, you can check it out. Uh, and this code calculates um the sum of all the odd number of, of power of all the odd numbers from uh, one to thousand right to 999 um in haskell this code would look exactly the same right so if i if i would write uh, compare this code um to the haskell code So let's let's let me try write it here. So we would have a list uh, from zero. Oh, sorry. We will have a list from uh, from zero to infinity, and then what we would do? We would do a map, and then we would map a function which is a power of two, right? So we would say um, um, power of two. We probably need to flip um, because now a power of two takes two as the left argument. So I would probably need to flip it, but that uh, that's not that important. What's important is the structure. And then we doing take, uh, then we would take, uh, we taking the first thousand, right? So we taking, oh, there is a variable so I can take upper and then we doing filter. And then again, I would kind of put a function here and then I'm doing uh, a fold at the end. So the fold is the, the final sum, right? Uh, and then there will be some parameters here and for the filter, there will be some parameters here, but the code would kind of effectively look the same, but it would read like it would read from left to uh, from right to left. Whereas here we're reading 
from top to bottom, if, if, if we put those dots in a sequence, we would be reading from left to right, right? But it's effectively the same thing, right? So look at this fold. Look at this fold here. Uh, I didn't say left or right here. So look at this fold and look at the anonymous function. So it has the accumulator and the, the number which is being passed from the collection and it's doing the sum, right? And the initial accumulator is zero, right? So the question to you is, what fold is it? Is it a left fold or right fold? So what do you need to ask yourself? You need to ask yourself two questions. One question is on which side was the accumulator on the, of the binary function? Was the accumulator on the left side or on the right side, right? That's the first question. Uh, so let's have a look. Accumulator is first. So it's on the left side. Right, so we have some sort of function which is being applied to all those uh, elements of the collection, and the accumulator is on the left. Which fold has the accumulator on the left? Huh? The left. <laughs> left. Left fold has accumulator on the left. The second question is: Are we iterating from the first element to the last one, or from the last element to the first one? What do you think happens here? First to last. I mean, that, it would be really uh, surprising if the default behavior was from last to first, right? So we can assume it's from first to last. So what does it tell you? That is the left fold, right? So the fold here is the left fold because the accumulator is on the left and we, we folding from um, you know first to last. Uh, there is. Uh, uh, and the opposite fold, which is called R fold, which folds from the last element to the first one. And it's called R fold and it's the right fold, right? Excellent. So this was uh, very similar to, uh, to Haskell and the fold left is the correct answer. Uh, and then the last final thing for today is, um, enums. Oh, we only have two people playing. So enumerations. Okay, so enumerations, as I was explaining at the very beginning of the, of the lecture is pretty much like data in Haskell. Um, so it's a very similar to algebraic data types in Haskell. They have two types option, which is exactly what maybe type is in Haskell. And they have result, which is exactly what either type is in, um, in Haskell. And this is, um, they use the keyword enum, which again, I, 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 would, I was sort of surprised why they picked that keyword for that particular thing. Um, and then what it is, if I rewrite it again in Haskell, so if we were to look at it in, in Haskell, yeah, let me, Let me do this. Right, so um, we would say data web event. And then we would say this is a type which has some constructors. It has page load constructor, uh, which doesn't take, it doesn't hold any value. It has page unload uh, constructor. And then the next one is it has uh key press which effectively takes a car as a value it holds right so it has kind of like a a, a single uh tuple value uh and then the next one um the next one is paste which would take a string and then the next one is uh a click which would take a record type, which has X 
uh, and y, and x is of type, um, yeah, uh, we would use the integer types uh, in Haskell. So let's just use int and then y is int, right? Uh, we could use the, the large integers in, in Haskell. But th this is basically what the uh, declaration of the algebraic data type is, and you're doing it with the enum keyword. So you are declaring um, your type, and then what constructors do you have? And then you use it basically the same as um, we used it in, in, uh, in Haskell. The only difference is, again, syntax. And here you would say web event double um, double colon and click to represent that particular constructor right so you prefix it with the with this and then follow use a particular um, thing whereas in um, you know in Haskell we just say click and it knows that click is of web event type right all right, so that's, uh, yeah, for the first time, I'm actually fine, I'm, I'm on time with the slides. Um, so there were no questions uh, from the audience and that's the last slide. So it's two o'clock and we managed to wrap it up perfectly on time. Fantastic. All right, any questions? Did I interest you in Rust? <laughs> um, I like Rust. I like uh, the concepts it has. It has uh, very nice uh, concepts around type classes, uh, which are called traits. Um, it, it has this powerful type system. What I don't like is those kind of inconsistencies of some of the decisions that you do need to remember those little nuances that are kind of inconsistent. And I don't actually like the syntax that much, uh, but we will have some lectures from, um, from a practitioner who likes the syntax and he prefers this syntax to Haskell syntax much more. So uh, the next um, Rust lecture will be from him and we will dive a little bit deeper into some, some of the concepts. All right, so thank you very much.